Hello there, YouTube. My name is Wind After but please call me Windy and welcome back to Read With Me, the fun series where we just sit down and we basically just read and escape from the world for a little while. Anywho, uh, happy St. Patty's Day. I'm so happy it's St. Patty's Day. This is one of my favorite holidays uh, of the entire year, uh, Eastern Valentine's Day along with it. Um, and of course I do have my green on, just I wanted to wear my sweater because it's cold uh, still, which kind of sucks, but you know, once I'm hoping that once spring hits, it'll warm up. I think I said that last video. Um, but yeah, we're going to be going back to reading Red Queen by Victoria Aveyard. Um, mm, excuse me. We're currently, I ate long, not long before this, so I hope you'll pardon me. Uh, but we are in chapters 21 and 22 of the book. Um, last two chapters, 19 and 20, we saw things of the parting ball, the Scarlet Guard attacked. Um, and I'm trying to think. Oh yeah, we also saw, like, from Mare's point of view, the four targets and whatnot uh, that the Scarlet Guard was aiming for. And one of them, Ptolemus, if I'm saying that right, did not die. And he's actually still alive at the moment. Um, but yeah, at the end of chapter 20, you know, King Tiberius was talking to all the other Silvers and saying, like, this is madness, it's terrorism, it's murder, it's this, it's that. You know, and they're saying that, like, all of them will die and et cetera, et cetera, um, basically. And at the end of chapter 20, both Mare and Maven were thinking, what have we done? Um, but yeah, we're in chapter 20, we're on chapters 21 and 22, so we're gonna go ahead and get started on that. Um, but yeah, so anyway, let us get started with chapters 21 and 22 of Red Queen. Um, oh, before I start, they do have four prisoners in, uh, the jail cells and everything. They have Walsh, Farley, Kilorn, and, well, they did have Tristan, but they killed him. Or, Ptolemus did. Anyway, uh... This is chapters 21 and 22 of Red Queen by Victoria Aveyard. <clears throat> Back in my room, I ripped the ruined dress off, letting the silk fall to the floor. The king's words replay in my head, peppered with flashes of this terrible night. Kilorn's eyes stand out through it all, a green fire burning me up. I must protect him, but how? If only I could trade myself for him again, my freedom for his. If only things were that simple anymore. Julian's lessons have never felt so sharp in my mind. The past is so much greater than this future. Julian. Julian. This resident... Oh, the residence halls, halls crawl with sentinels in security, every one of them on edge. But I've long perfected the art of slipping by unnoticed, and Julian's door is not far away. Despite the hour, he's awake, poring over books. Everything looks the same. Like nothing's happened. Maybe he doesn't know. But then I noticed the bottle of brown liquor on the table. A occupying a spot usually reserved for tea. Of course he knows. In the light of recent events, I would think our lessons have been cancelled for the time being. He says over the pages of his book. Still, he shuts it with a snap, turning his full attention to me. Not to mention, it's quite late. I need you, Julian. Does this have anything to do with the sun shooting? Yes, they've already thought up a clever name. He points to the dark video screen in the corner. It's been on the news for hours now. The king's addressing the country in the morning. I remember the fluffy, blonde no newswoman reporting the capital bombing more than a month ago. There were few injuries then, and still the marketplace rioted. What will they do now? How many innocent reds will pay? Or is this about the four terrorists currently locked in the cells of this structure? Julian presses on, measuring my response. Excuse me, I mean three. Ptolemy Samus certainly lives up to his reputation. They're not terrorists, I, say, I reply calmly, trying to keep myself in check. Shall I show you the definition of terrorism, Mayor? His tone stings. Their cause might be just, but their methods... Besides, what you say doesn't matter. He gestures to the video screen again. They have their own version of the truth. And that's the only one people will hear. My teeth grind together painfully, bone on bone. Are you going to help or not? I am a teacher and somewhat of an outcast. In case you haven't noticed, what can I possibly do? Julian, please. I can feel my last chance slipping through my fingers. You're a saner. You can tell the guards. Make them do anything you want. You can set the prisoners free. But he remains still. Sipping peacefully at his drink. He doesn't grimace like men normally do. The bite of alcohol is familiar to him. 
Tomorrow they'll be interrogated. And no matter how strong they are, no matter how long they hold out, the truth will be found. Slowly, I take Julian's hand, holding fingers worn rough by paper. This was my plan. I'm one of them. He doesn't need to know about Maven. It will only make him angrier. The half-lie does its job well. I can see it in Julian's eyes. You? You did this? He stammers. The shooting, the bombing. The bomb was unexpected. The bomb was a horror. He narrows his eyes, and I can see the cocks turning in his mind. Then he snaps entirely. I told you. I told you not to get in over your head. He slams a fist down on the table, looking angrier than I've ever seen him before. And now, he breathes, staring at me with so much sorrow it makes my heart hurt. Now I must watch you drown? If they escape... He throws back the rest of his drink with a gulp. With a snap of his wrist, he smashes the glass on the floor, making me jump. And what about me? Even if I take away the cameras, the guards' memories, anything that could implicate either of us, the queen will know. Shaking his head, he sighs. She'll take my eyes for this. And Julian will never read again. How can I ask for that? Then let me die. The words stick in my throat. I deserve it as much as they do. He can't let me die. He won't. I'm the little lightning girl, and I'm going to make the world change. When he speaks again, he sounds hollow. They called my sister's death a suicide. Slowly, he traces his fingers across his wrists, dwelling on a long ago memory. That was a lie, and I knew it. She was a sad woman, but she never would have done such a thing. Not when she had Cal and Tib. Tib. She was murdered, and I said nothing. I was afraid, and I let her die in shame. And since that day, I've been working to fix that, waiting in the shadows of this monstrous world, waiting for my time to avenge her. He raises his eyes to me. They sparkle with tears. I suppose this will be a good place to start. It doesn't take long for Julian to figure out a plan. All we need is a magnetron and some blind cameras, and luckily, I can provide both. Lucas knocks on my bedroom door, not two minutes after I summon him. What can I do for you, Mare? He says, jumpier than usual. I know his time overseeing the Queen's interrogation of servants must not have been easy. At least he'll be too distracted to notice I'm shaking. I'm hungry. The words rehearse. The rehearsed words come easier than they should. You know, dinner never happens. I was wondering, do I look like a cook? You should have called the kitchen. That's their job. I just... Well... I don't think now's a good time for the servants to be roaming around. People are still pretty on edge. I don't want anyone getting hurt because I didn't get dinner. You just have to escort me. That's all. And who knows? You might get a cookie out of it. Sighing like an annoyed teenager, Lucas holds out an arm. As I take it, I glance at the cameras in the hall, making them die off. Here we go. I should feel wrong about using Lucas, knowing firsthand what it's like to have your mind toyed with. But this is for Kilorn's life. Lucas is still charting when we turn the corner, running smack into Julian. Lord Chaco's Lucas begins, moving to bow his head. But Julian takes him by the chin, moving quicker than I ever thought he could. Before I can respond, Julian glares into his eyes, and the struggle dies before it even begins. His honeyed words, smooth as butter and strong as iron, fall on open, ear fall on open ears. Take us to the cell. Use the service halls. Keep us away from patrols. Do not remember this. <coughs> Excuse me. Lucas, usually all smiles and jokes, falls into a strange, half-hypnotized state. His eyes glaze over, and he doesn't notice when Julian reaches down to take his gun. But he, mar but he marches all the same, leading us through the maze of the hall. At each turn, I wait for the feel of electric eyes, shutting off everything in our path. Julian does the same to the guards forcing them to not remember us as we pass. Together, we make an unbeatable team, and it's not long before we stand at the top of the dungeon stairs. There'll be sentinels down there, too many for Julian to take care of on his own. Speak not a word, Julian hisses to Lucas, who nods in understanding. Now it's my turn to lead us. I expect to be afraid, but the dim light and the late hour feel familiar. This is where I belong, sneaking and lying and stealing. Who is it? State your name and business. One of the sentinels shouts, shouts up at us. I recognize her voice. Cleocon. 
the shiver who tortured Farley. Perhaps I can convince Julian to see her off a cliff. I draw myself up to full height, though it's my voice and tone that matter most. My name is Lady Marina Titanos, betrothed of the Prince Maven, I snap, moving down the steps with as much grace as I can. My voice is cold and sharp, mirroring Ilaris and Evangeline's. I have strength and power, too. And I don't share my business with sentinels. At the sight of me, the four sentinels exchange glances, questioning one another. One, a large man with pig eyes, even looks me up and down in a rude manner. Behind the bar, behind the bars, Gilorn and Walsh jump to attention. Farley doesn't move from her corner, arms curled around her knees. For a second, I think she might be sleeping, until she moves and her blue eyes reflect the light. I need to know, my lady. Leocone says, sounding apologetic. She nods to Julian and Lucas, who follow me down. Goes for you two as well. I would like a pri private audience with these. I throw as much disgust into my voice as I can. It's not hard, with the pig-eyed sentinels standing so close. Creatures. We have questions that must be answered and wrongs to repay. Don't we, Julian? Julian sneers. Put on a good show. It'll be easy to make them sing. Not possible, my lady. Pig eyes snorts. His accent is hard and rough. From Harbor Bay. Our orders are to stay right here, all night. We move for no one. Once, a boy in the stilts called me a rotten flirt for charming him out of a good pair of boots. You understand my position, don't you? I will be a princess soon, and the favor of princess is a very valuable thing. Besides, the red rats must be taught a lesson, a painful one. Pig eyes blink sluggish me at me, thinking it over. Julian hovers over my shoulder ready with his sweet words if I need them. Two heartbeats pass before Pig Eyes nods, waving to the others. We can give you five minutes. My face hurts, my face hurts from smiling so widely, but I don't care. Thank you so much. I am in your debt. All of you. They tromp away in a single file, their boots scuffling, or scuffing. As soon as they reach the top landing, I allow myself to hope. Five minutes will be more than enough. Kilorn almost jumps at the bars eager to be free of his cell, and Walsh pulls Farley to her feet. But I don't move at all. I don't intend to free them. Not yet. Mare, Kilorn whispers, puzzled at my hesitation. But I silence him with a look. The bomb. Smoke and fire cloud my thoughts, bring me back to the moment the ballroom exploded. Tell me about the bomb. I expect them to fall over themselves in apologies, to beg for my forgiveness. But instead, the three exchange blank looks, Farley leans against the bars, her eyes on fire. I don't know anything about that, she hisses, barely audible. I never authorized such a thing. It was supposed to be organized with special targets. We do not kill at random, without purpose. The capital, the other bombings? You know those buildings were empty. No one died there, not because of us, she says evenly. I swear to you, Mayor, this was not our doing. Do you really think we tried to blow up our greatest hope? Kilorn adds. I don't need to ask to know what he means. Finally, I nod, I nod over my shoulder to Julian. Open the cell. Quickly. Oh, quietly. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. Okay, that's him. Okay. Open the cell. Quietly, Julian murmurs. His, his hands on Lucas's face. The magnetron complies, forcing the bars into an open O wide enough to step through. Walsh comes out first, her eyes wide in amazement. Kilorn is next, helping Farley fit through the bars. Her arm still dangles helplessly. The healer missed a spot. I gesture to the wall, and they move soundlessly. Mice on stone. Walsh's eyes touch on far Tristan's body, still lifeless in the cell. Mm, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. But she stays put beside, Far or beside Farley. Julian shoves Lucas in next to them before taking his spot next to the foot of the stairs, across from the freed prisoners. I take the other side press myself in next to Kilorn. Even though he spent the night in the cells, with a dead body for company, he still smells like home. I knew you'd come, he whispers in my ear. I knew it. But there's no time for pleasantries or celebrations. Not until they're away safely. Across the open gap of the stairwell, Julian nods at me. He's ready. Sentinel Glyacon, may I have a word? I shout the stairs, laying the bait for our next trap. The shuffle of feet tells me she's taken it. What is it, my lady? When she reaches the floor, her eyes straight to the open cell and she gasps behind her mask. 
Oh, and she gasped behind her masks. But Julian is too quick, even for a sentinel. You went for a walk. You returned to find this. You do not remember us. Call down one of the others, he murmurs. His voice, a terrible song. Sentinel Tyros, you are needed, she says flatly. Now you will sleep. She drops almost before the last word leaves his lips. But Julian catches her around the middle and lays her gently down behind him. Kiloran exhales in surprise, impressed by Julian, who allows himself a small, please smile. Tyros comes down next, confused but eager to serve. Julian does it again. He's seeing his orders in a few whispered seconds. I didn't expect sentinels to be so stupid, but it makes sense. They're trained from childhood in the art of combat. In the art of combat, logic and intelligence are not the highest priorities. But the last two, Pig Eyes and Healer, are not complete fools. When Tyros calls out, ordering the skin healer sentinel to come down, they mutter to each other, About finished, Lady Titanos? Uh, oh, Pig Eyes calls, his voice wary. Thinking quickly, I shout back to them, Yes, we're finished. Your companions have returned to their posts. I want to make sure you do as well. Oh, have they? Is that right, Tyros? With blinding speed, Julia kneels over the fainted Tyros. He pries his eyes open, holding the lids. Say you've returned to your post. Say the lady has finished. Return to my post, Tyros drones. Hopefully the lawn stairwell and stone walls will distort his voice. The lady has finished. Big Eyes grunts to himself. Very well. Their boots stamp against the steps, both coming down together. Two. Julian cannot handle two alone. I feel Keylorn tense at my back, his fists clenching as he prepares for anything. With one hand, I push him back against the wall, while the other grows white with sparks. The footsteps stop, just beyond the opening. I can't see them, and neither can Julian. But Pig Eyes breathes like a dog. The healer is there, waiting just beyond our reach. In total silence, it's hard not to hear the click of a gun. Julian's eyes widen, but he stands firm, one hand closing around his stolen weapon. I don't even want to breathe. Breathe. Knowing the edge we're all standing on, the wall seems to shrink, boxing us into a stone coffin with no escape. I feel very calm when I slide out in front of the steps, my sparking hand behind my back. I expect to feel bullets at any minute, but the pain never comes. They won't shoot me, not until I've given them a good reason. Is there a pro some problem, sentinels? I sneer, quickening an eyebrow like I've seen Evangeline do a hundred times. Slowly... I take a step up, bringing the pair of them into view. They stand side by side, twi fingers twitching on twin triggers. I'd prefer it if you wouldn't point your guns at me. Pig Eyes glares at me outright, but it does nothing to faze me. You are a lady. Act like it. Act for your life. Where's your friend? Oh, he's coming along. One of the prisoners had him has a mouth on her. She needs some extra attention. The lie comes so easily. Bartis really does make perfect. Grinning, Pig Eyes lowers his gun a bit. The scarred bitch I had to show her the back of my hand, my back of my hand myself. He chuckles. I laugh with him and dream about what lightning could do his, to his fleshy, pale eyes. As I move closer, the skin healer puts one hand on the metal rail, rail, blocking my way. I do the same. It feels cold in my hand and solid. Easy does it, I tell myself, pushing just enough energy into my sparks, not enough to burn. Not enough to scar, but enough to take care of them both. It's like threading a needle, and for once, I'm the sewing expert. Above me, the healer doesn't laugh with his friend. His eyes are bright silver, with the mask and fiery cloak. He looks like a demon from a nightmare. What's behind your what's behind your back? he hisses through the mask. I shrug, allowing myself one more step. Nothing. Oh nothing. <laughs> nothing, Sentinel Skonos. The next words are ragged. You lie. We react in the same second, blasting into action. The bullet hits me in the stomach, but my lightning blazes up the metal rail, through his skin and into the healer's brain. Pig Eye shouts, firing his own gun. The bullet digs into the wall, missing me by inches, but I don't miss him, lashing with a ball of sparks behind my back. They slide past me, both unconscious, their muscles switching with wide shocks. And then I'm falling. I briefly wonder if the stone floor will smash my skull. I suppose that I suppose that's easier than bleeding to death. Instead, 
Lawn, lawn arms catch me. Mayor, you'll be fine, Keelorn whispers. His hands cover my stomach, trying to stop the bleeding. His eyes are as green as grass. They stand out in the world, fading to darkness. It's nothing at all. Put those on, Julian snaps to the others. Farley and Walsh rushed past me to pull on the, pull on the fire-red cloaks and masks. You too. He yanks Keelorn off of me. Off me, almost throwing him across the room in his haste. Julian, I choke out, trying to grab him. I must thank him. But he's beyond my reach, kneeling over the healer. He rips open the sentinel's eyes and sings, ordering him to wake up. The next thing I know, the healer still stares down at me, his hands on my wound. It only takes a second before the world shifts back to normal. In the corner, Kilorn breathes a sigh of relief and pulls a cloak over his head. Her as well, I point to Farley. Julian nods and directs the healer over to her. With an audible, her shoulder snaps back into place. Much obliged, she says, pulling the mask over her face. Walsh stands over us all, her mask forgotten in her hand. She stares at the fallen sentinels, jaw agape. Are they dead? She asks, whispering like a frightened child. Julian looks up from pig eyes, finished singing to him. Hardly. This lot will wake up in a few hours. And if you're lucky, no one will know you're gone until then. I can work with a few hours, Farley smart smacks at Walsh, snapping her back to reality. Get your head on straight, girl. We've got a lot of running to do tonight. It doesn't take long to, sip, to slip them through the last few passages. Even so, my fear grows with each passing heartbeat until we find ourselves in the middle of Cal's garage. The, sl the slack-jawed Lucas tears a hole in the metal door like he's ripping paper, revealing the night beyond. Walsh hugs me, taking me by surprise. I don't know how, she mutters, but I hope you become queen one day. Imagine what you could do then. The Red Queen. I accept a smile at the impossible thought. Go before your nonsense rubs off on me. Farley is the one for hugs, but she does pat me on the shoulder. We'll meet again, and soon. Not like this, I hope. Her face splits into a rare, toothy smile. Despite the scar, I realize she's very pretty. Not like this, she echoes, before slipping out into the night with Walsh. I know I can't ask you to come with me, he lorn mutters, moving to follow them. He stares at his hands, examining scars I know better than my own mind. Look at me, you idiot. Sighing, I force myself to shove him towards freedom. The cause needs me here. You need me here, too. What I need and what I want are two very different things. I try to laugh, but I can't find the strength. This is not our end, Mare, Killorn murmurs, embracing me. He laughs to himself, the noise vibrating in his chest. Red Queen has a nice ring to it. Get on, you fool. Never have I smiled so brightly and still felt so sad. He spares me one last glance and nods to Julian, before stepping out into, into the darkness. The metal knits back together behind him, blocking my friends from sight. Where they're going, I don't want to know. Julian has to pull me away, but he doesn't scold me for my long goodbye. I think he's more preoccupied with Lucas, who, in his day state, has begun to drool. Has begun to drool. Chapter 22 that night, I dream of my brother Shade coming to visit me in the darkness. He smells like gunpowder, but when I blink, he disappears and my mind screams what I already know. Shade is dead. When morning comes, a series of shuffles and slams makes me bolt awake, sitting up in my bed. I expect to see sentinels, Cal, or a murderous Ptolemus ready to rip me apart for what I've done. But it's just the maids bustling in my closet. They look more hairy than usual and pull down with my clothes with abandon. What's going on? In the closet, the girls freeze. They bow, hands full of silk and linen. As I come closer, I realize they're staying over a set of leather trunks. Are we going somewhere? Orders, my lady, one says, her eyes loader, lowered. We only know what we're told. Of course, well, I'm just going to get dressed then. I reach for the nearest outfit, intending to do something for myself for once, but the maids beat me to it. Five minutes later, they have me painted and ready, dressed in odd leather pants and a flouncy shirt. I'd much prefer my train suit over everything else, but apparently it's not proper to wear the thing outside of sessions. Lucas? I asked the empty hallway, half expecting him to pop out from, the, from an alcove. But Lucas is nowhere to be found, and I head off to protocol, expecting him to cross my path. When he doesn't, a trill of fear ripples through me. Julian made him forget last night, but maybe something slipped through the cracks. Maybe he's being questioned. 
punished for the night he can't remember and what we forced him to do. But I'm not alone for long. Maven steps into my path. His lips quirked into an amused smile. You're up early. Then he leans in, speaking in a low whisper, especially for having such a late night. I don't know what you mean, I try for an innocent tone. The prisoners are gone. All three of them disappeared into thin air. I put a hand to my heart, letting myself look shocked for the camera. By my colors! A few reds? Escaped from us? That seems impossible. It does indeed. Though the smile re remains, his eyes darken slightly. Of course, that brings everything into question. The power outages, the failing security system, not to mention a troop of sentinels with blank spots across their memories. He stares pointedly at me. I return his sharp gaze, let him seem my unease. Your mother interrogated them. Interrogated them. She did. And will she be talking to... I choose my words very carefully. Anyone else regarding the escape? Officers? Guards? Maven shakes his head. Whoever did this did it well. I helped her with the questioning and directed her to anyone of suspicion. Directed. Directed away from me. I breathe a small sigh of relief and squeeze his arm, thanking him for his protection. Besides, we may never find who never find who did it. People have been fleeing since last night. They think the hall is no longer safe. After last night, they're probably right. I slip my arm into his, drawing him closer. What did your mother learn of the bomb? His voice drops to a whisper. There was no bomb. What? It was an explosion, but it was also an accident. A bullet punctured a gas line into the, in the floor. And when Cal's fire hit it, he trails off, blending his hands to the talking. It was Mother's idea to use that to our... Ah, advantage. We don't kill without purpose. She turn, She's turning the guard into monsters. He nods gravely. No one will stand with them. Not even Reds. My blood seems to boil. More lies. She's beating us without firing a shot or drawing a blade. Words are all she needs. And now I'm being sent deeper into a world. To Archeon. Archeon, that is it. You won't see your family again. Jisa will grow until you don't recognize her anymore. Bri and Trammy will marry, have children, and forget you. Dad will die slowly, suffocated by his wounds. And when he's gone, Mom will slip away too. Maven lets me think, his eyes thoughtful as he watches the emotions rise in my face. He always lets me think. Sometimes his silence is better than anyone else's words. Mm. Excuse me, so sorry. How long do we have left here? We go this afternoon. Most of the court is leaving before that, but we have to take the boat. Keep some tradition in all this madness. When I was a little girl, I used to sit on my porch and watch the pretty boats pass, heading down river to the capital. Shade would laugh at me for wanting to catch a glimpse of the king. I didn't realize it then. Realize then it was just part of the pageant, another display just like the arena fights to show exactly how low we were in the grand scheme of the world. Now, I'm going to be part of it again. This time, standing on the other side. At least you'll get to see your home again, if only for a little while, he adds, trying to be gentle. Yes, Maven, that's just what I want. To stand and watch my home and my old life pass by. But that's the price I must pay. Freeing Keylorn and the others means losing my few days in the val- My last few days in the valley. And it's a trade I'm happy to make. We're interrupted by a loud crash from a nearby passage. The one leading to Cal's room. Maven reacts first. Moving to the edge of the hall before I can. Like he's trying to protect me from something. Bad dreams, brother? He calls out. Worried by what he sees. In response, Cal steps out into the hallway. His fists clench like he's trying to keep his own hands in check. Gone is the blood-stained uniform. Replaced by what looks like Ptolemy's armor though Cal's has a reddish tint. I want to slap him, to claw at him and scream for what he did to Farley and Tristan and Kilorn and Walsh. The sparks dance inside me, begging to be loosed. That's weird word. But after all, what did I expect? I know what he is and what he believes in. Reds are not worth saving. So, I speak as civilly as I can. Will you be leaving with your legion? I know he isn't, judging by the livid anger in his eyes. Once I feared he would go, he would go, and now I wish he would. I can't believe I cared about saving him. I can't believe that was ever a thought in my head. Cal heaves a breath. The Shadow Legion isn't going anywhere. Father will not allow it. Not now. It's too dangerous, and I am, 
and I'm too valuable. You know, he's right. Maven puts a hand on his brother's shoulder, trying to calm him. I remember watching Cal do the same thing to Maven, but now the crown is on a different head. You are the heir, and he can't- oh, heir. He cannot afford to lose you, too. I'm a soldier, Cal spits, shrugging away from his brother's touch. I can't just sit by and let others fight for me. I won't do it. He sounds like a child waiting for a toy. He must enjoy killing. It makes me sick. I don't speak. Letting the diplomatic maven talk for me. He always knows what to say. Find another cause. Build another cycle. Double your training. Drill your men. Prepare yourself for when the danger passes. Cal, you can do a thousand other things, and none of them end with you being killed in some kind of ambush, he says, glaring up at his brother. Then he smirks, trying to light the mood. You never change, Cal. You just can't sit still. After a moment of harsh silence, Cal breaks into a weak smile. Never. His eyes flick to me, but I won't get caught in his bronze stare. Not again. I turn my head, pretending to examine a painting on the wall. Nice armor, I sneer. It will go well for your collection. He looks stunned, even confused, but quickly recovers. His smile is gone now, replaced by narrow eyes and a clenched jaw. He taps at his armor. It sounds like claw on stone. This was a gift from Ptolemus. I seem to share a common cause with my betrothed's brother. My betrothed. Like that's supposed to make me jealous or something. Maven eyes the armor warily. What do you mean? Ptolemus commands the officers in the capital. Together with me and my legion, we might be able to do something of use, even with the city. Oh, even within the city. Cold fear steals into my heart again, brushing away whatever hope and happiness last night's success brought me. And what is that exactly? I hear myself breathe. I'm a good hunter. He's a good killer. Cal takes a step backward, walking away from us. I can feel him slipping down not just the hall, but a dark and twisted path. It makes me afraid for the boy who taught me how to dance. No, not for him. Of him. And that is worse than all my other terrors and nightmares. Between the two of us, we'll root out the Scarlet Guard. We'll end this rebellion once and for all. There's no schedule for today, as everyone is too busy leaving to teach or train. Fleeing might be a better word, but that's because that's certainly what this looks like from my vantage point in the entrance hall. I used to think Silvers were untouchable gods who were never threatened, never scared. Now I know the opposite is true. They spend so long at the top, protected and isolated, that they've forgotten they can fall. Their strength has become their weakness. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once, I was afraid of these walls, frightened by such beauty. But I see the cracks now. It's like the day of the bombing, when I realized Silvers were not invincible. Then it was an explosion. Now a few bullets leave and have shattered diamond glass, revealing fear and paranoia beneath. Silvers fleeing from reds, lions running from mice. The king and queen oppose each other. The court has their own alliances. And Cal, the perfect prince, the good soldier, is a torturous, terrible enemy. Anyone can betray anyone. Cal and Maven bid everyone goodbye, doing their duty despite the organized chaos. The airships wait not far off. The whir of their engines audible even inside. I want to see the great machines up close, but moving would mean braving the crowd, and I can't stomach the stares of the grief-stricken. Altogether, twelve died last night, but I refuse to learn their names. I can't have them weighing on me, not when I need my wits more than ever. When I can't watch any longer, my feet take me where they will, wandering through now familiar passages. Chambers close as I pass, being shut up for the season, until the court returns. I won't, I know. Servants pull white sheets over the furniture and paintings and statues, until the whole place looks haunted by ghosts. It's not long before I find myself standing in the doorway of Julian's old classroom, and the sight shocks me. The stacks of books, the desk, even the maps are gone. The room looks larger, but feels smaller. It once held whole worlds, but now... Holds only dust and crumpled paper. My eyes linger on the wall where the huge map used to be. Once I couldn't understand it. Now I remember it like an old friend. Norda, the Lakelands, Piedmont, Prairie, Taraxis, Montfort, Sudan, and all the disputed lands in between. 
other countries, other peoples, all torn along the lines of blood just like us. If we change, will they? Or will they try to destroy us too? I hope you'll remember your lessons. Julian's voice draws out from... Julian's voice draws me out from of my thoughts, back to the empty room. He stands behind me, following my gaze to the map wall. I'm sorry I couldn't teach you more. We'll have plenty of time for lessons in Archeon. His smile is bittersweet and almost painful to look at. With the jolt, I realize I can feel cameras watching us for the very first time. Julian? The archivist and Delphi have offered me a position restoring some old texts. The lie is as plain as the nose on his face. It seems they've been digging through the wash and came on some storage bunkers. Mountains to go through, apparently. You'll like that very much. My voice catches in my throat. You knew he would have to leave. You forced him into this last night, when you put his life in danger for Kilorns. Will you visit when you can? Yes, of course. Another lie. Alara will figure out his role soon enough, and then he'll be on the run. It only makes sense to get a head start. I've got you something. I'd rather have Julian than any gift, but I try to look thankful anyways. It's a good advice. He shakes his head, smiling. You'll see when you get to the capital. Then he stretches out his arms, beckoning to me. I have to go, so send me off properly. Hugging him is like hugging my father or the brothers I'll never see again. I don't want to let him go, but the danger is too great for him to stay. And we both know it. Thank you, Mare, he whispers in my ear. You remind me so much of her. I don't need to ask to know he's talking about Corianne, about the sister he lost so long ago. I'll miss you, little lightning girl. Right now, the nickname doesn't sound so bad. God, I low-key want to cry at that part. Oh, God. <laughs> I don't have the strength to marvel at the boat, driven through the water by electric engines. Black, silver, and red flags flat from every pole, marking this as the king's ship. When I was a girl... I used to wonder why the king laid claim to our color. It was just so beneath him. Now I realize the flags are red like his flame. Like the destruction and the people he controls. The sentinels from last night have been reassigned. He even mutters as we walk along the deck. Reassigned is just a fancy word for punished. Remembering pig eyes and the way he looked at me. I'm not sorry at all. Where do they go? The front, of course. They'll be attached to some rabble group. To camp to Captain Injured, Incapable, or Bad-Tempered Soldiers. Those are usually the first to be sent in, the tre in a trench push. By the shadows behind his eyes, I can tell Maven knows this firsthand. The first to die. He nods solemnly. And Lucas? I haven't seen him since yesterday. He's alright, traveling with House Samos, regrouping with family. The shooting has everyone on their heels, even the high houses. Mm, excuse me. Relief washes over me, as well as sadness. I miss Lucas already, but it's good to know he's safe and far from Ilara's prying. Maven bites his lip, looking subdued. But not for long. Answers are coming. What do you mean? They found blood down in the cells. Red blood. My gunshot wound is gone, but the memory of the pain has not faded. So? So, whichever friend of yours had the misfortune to be wounded won't be much a secret much longer. If the blood base does its job. Blood base. The blood database. Any red born within a hundred miles of civilization gets sampled at birth. Started out as a project to understand exactly what the difference is between us. But it ended up just another way to put a collar on your people. In the bigger cities, reds don't use IDs, but or ID cards, but blood tags. They're sampled at every gate. Coming and going. Tracked like animals. Briefly, I think of the old documents the king threw me that day in the throne room. My name, my photograph, and a smear of blood were in there. My blood. They have my blood. And they... They can figure out whose blood it is, just like that? It takes some time, a week or so, but yes, that's how it's supposed to work. His eyes fall to my shaking hands, and he covers them with his own, letting warmth bleed into my suddenly cold skin. Mare? He shot me, I whisper. The sentinel shot me. It's my blood they found. And then his hands are just as cold as mine. For all his clever ideas, Maven has nothing to say to this. He just stares. His breath coming in tiny, scared puffs. I know the look on his face. I worry every time I'm forced to say goodbye to someone. <coughs> Excuse me. 
It's too bad we didn't stay any longer, I murmur, looking out at the river. I would have liked to die, clo liked to die close to home. Another breeze sends a current of my hair across my face, but Maven brushes it away and pulls me close with startling ferocity. Oh! His kiss is not all like his brother's. Maven is more desperate, surprising himself as much as me. He knows I'm sinking fast, a stone dropping through the river, and he wants to drown with me. I will fix this, he murmurs against my lips. I have never seen his eyes so bright and sharp. I won't let them hurt you. You have my word. Part of me wants to believe him. Maven, you can't fix everything. You're right. I can, he replies, an edge to his voice. But I can convince someone with more power than me. Oh. When the temperature around us rises, Maven pulls back. His jaw tense and clenched. The way his eye fla eyes flash, I half expect him to attack whoever interrupted us. I don't turn around, mostly because I can't feel my limbs. I've gone numb, though my lips tingle, still tingle with memory. What this means? I don't know. What I feel, I can't begin to understand. The queen requests your presence on the, on the viewing dock. Cal's voice grinds like stone. He sounds almost angry, but his brawn eyes look sad, defeated even. Passing the stilts mare. Yes, the shoreline is already familiar to me. I know that mangled tree, that stretch of bank, and the echo of saws and falling trees is unmistakable. This is home. With great pain, I force myself away from the rail to face Cal, who seems to be having a silent conversation with his brother. Thank you, Cal, I murmur, still trying to process Maven's kiss and, of course, my own impending doom. Cal walks away, his usually straight back bow bowed. Each footfall sends a pain of guilt through me, making me remember our dance and our own kiss. I hurt everyone, especially myself. Maven stares after his fleeing brother. He does not like to lose, and he lowers his voice, now so close to me I can see the tiny flecks of silver in his eyes. Neither do I. I won't lose you, Mare. I won't. You'll never lose me. Another lie, and we both know it. The viewing, viewing deck dominates the front of the ship, enclosed by glass, stretching from side to side. Brown shakes take, take form on the riverbank, and the old hill with the arena appears out of the trees. We're too far from the bank to see anyone properly, but I know my house in an instant. The old flag still flutters on the porch, still embroidered with three red stars. One has a black stripe through it, in honor of Shade. Shade was executed. You're supposed to rip a star off after that. But they didn't. They held on to him in their own little rebellion. I want to point my home out to Maven, to tell him about the village. I've seen his life, and I want to show him mine. But the viewing deck is silent, all of us staring at the village as we come closer and closer. The villagers don't care about you and want to scream. Only fools will stop to watch. Only the fools will waste a moment on you. As the boat continues on, I begin to think about the village. The whole village night, village might be made of fools. All two thousand of them seeing crowded around to the bank. Some stand ankle deep in the river. From this distance, they all look the same: fading hair and worn clothes, blotchy skinned, tired, hungry, all the things I used to be, and angry. Even from the boat, I can feel their anger. They don't cheer or call out our names. No one waves. No one even smiles. What is this? I breathe, expecting no one to answer. But the queen does, with great relish. Such a waste, parading down the river when no one will watch. It seems we fixed that. Something tells me this is another mandatory event, like the fights, like the broadcasts. Officers tore sick elders from their beds and exhausted workers from the floor, forcing them to watch us. A whip cracks somewhere on the bank, followed closely by a woman's scream. Stay in line, echoes over the crowd. Their eyes never falter, staring straight ahead. So still I can't even see where the disruption is. What happened to make them so lenient? What has already been done? Tears prick at my eyes as I watch. There are more cracks and a few babies wail, but no one on the bank, bank protests. Suddenly, I'm at the edge of the desk. De desk, deck, wanting to burst through the glass with every inch of myself. Going somewhere, Marina? Ilara purrs from a place next to the king. She sips placidly at a drink, 
surveying me over the rim of her glass. Why are you doing this? Arms crossed over her, her magnificent gown. Evangeline eyes me with a sneer. Why do you care? But her words fall on deaf ears. They know what happened at the hall. They might even agree with it. So they need to see that we aren't defeated, Cal murmurs. His eyes on the riverbank. He can't even look at me. The coward. We aren't even bleeding. Another whip cracks and I flinch, almost feeling the lash on my skin. Did you order them to be beaten as well? He doesn't rise to my challenge, jaw firmly clenched shut. But when another villager cries out, protesting against the officers, he lets his eyes close. Stand back, Lady Titanos. The king's voice rumbles like a faraway thunder. An order if there ever was one. I can almost feel his smug smile when I step away, moving back to Maven. This is a red village. You know that better than it, than us all. They harbor the these terrorists. Feed them. Protect them. Become them. They are children who have done wrong, and they must learn. Uh, oh. I open my mouth to argue, but the queen bares her teeth. Perhaps you know of a few who should be made, a made an example of? She says calmly, gesturing to the shoreline. The words die in my throat, chased away by her threat. No, your majesty, I don't. Then stand back and be silent, she grins, for your time to speak will come. This is what they me need me for, a moment like this, when the sc scales could tip, a tip out of their favor. But I can't protest. I can only do as she commands and watch as my home fades, fades out of sight, forever. <clears throat> Excuse me. The closer we get to the capital, the larger the village becomes, or the villages become. Soon, the landscape fades from lumber and farming communities to proper towns. They center on massive mills, with brick homes and dormitories to house the red laborers. Like the other villagers, their inhabitants stand in the streets to watch us pass. Officers bark, whips crack, and I never get used to it. I flinch every time. Mmm, excuse me, so sorry. Then the town's replaced by sprawling estates and mansions, palaces like the hall, made of stone and glass and swirling marble. Each one seems more magnificent than the last. Where'd it go? Oh. Mmm, excuse me. <laughs> Their lawns slope to the river, decorated with green warden gardens and beautiful fountains. The houses themselves look like the work of gods, each one a different kind of beautiful. But the windows are dark. The doors are closed. Where the villages and towns were full of people, these seem devoid of life. Only the flags flying high, over e one over each structure. Let me know if someone lives there at all. Blue for House Osanos. Silver for Samos. Brown for Rambos. And so on. Now I know the colors by heart, putting faces to each silent home. I even killed the, owner even killed the owners of a few. River Row, Marine, or Marine, Maven explains. The country residences, should a lord or lady wish to escape the city. My gaze lingers on the Arrayal home, a columned wonder of black marble. Stone panthers guard the porch, snarling up at the sky. Even the statues put a chill on me, making member Ara Iral and her pressing questions. There's no one here. These houses, the, these houses, these houses are empty most of the year. And no one would dare leave the city now. Not with this guard business. He offers me a small, bitter smile. They would rather hide behind their diamond walls and let my brother do their fighting for them. If only one, if only no one had to fight at all. He shakes his head. It does no good to dream. We watch in silence as River Row falls behind and another forest rises up on the banks. The trees are strange. Very tall with black bark and dark red leaves. It is deathly quiet as no force should be. Not even bird song breaks the silence. And overhead, the sky darkens. But not from the waning after the afternoon light. Black clouds gather, hovering over the trees like a thick blanket. And what's this? Even my voice sounds muffled, and I'm suddenly glad for the glass casing over the deck. To my surprise, the others have gone, leaving us alone to watch the gloom settle. Maven glances at the forest, face pulled in distaste. Barrier trees. They keep the pollution from traveling, traveling farther upriver. The well green wardens made them years ago. Choppy brown waves foam against the boat, 
leaving a film of black grime on the gleaming steel hull. The world takes on a strange tint, like I'm looking through a dirty glass. The low-lying clouds aren't clouds at all, but smoke pouring from a thousand from a thousand chimneys, obscuring the sky. Gone are the trees and the grass. This is a land of ash and decay. Greytown, Maven murmurs. Factories stretch out as far as I can see, dirty and massive and humming with electricity. It hits me like a fist, almost knocking me off my feet. My heart tries to keep up with the unearthly pulse, and I had to sit down, feeling my blood race. I thought my world was wrong, that my life was unfair, but I could never dream of a place like Great Town. Power stations glow in the gloom, pulsing electric blue and sickly green into the spider work of the wires in the air. Transports piled high with cargo move along the raised roads, shilling goods from one factory to another. They scream at one another in a noisy mess of tangled traffic, moving like sluggish black blood and gray veins. Worst of all, little houses surround each factory in an ordered square, one on top of the other, with narrow streets in between. Slums. Beneath such a smoky sky, I doubt the workers ever see daylight. They walk between the factories and their homes, flooding the streets during a shift change. There are no officers, no cracking whips, no blank stares. No one is making them, making them watch us pass. The king doesn't need to show off here, I realize. They are broken from birth. These are the techies, I whisper hoarsely. Remember the name, the silver so blith, so blithly? Toss around. They make the lights, the cameras, the video screens. The guns, the bullets, the bombs, the ships, the transports, Maven adds. They keep the power running. They keep our water clean. They do everything for us. And they receive nothing but smoke in return. Why don't they leave? He just shrugs. This is the only life they know. Most techies will never leave their own alley. They can't even conscript. Can't even conscript. Their lives are so terrible that the war is a better alternative. And they're not even allowed to go. Like everything else on the river, the factories fade away. But the image stays with me. I must not forget this, something tells me. I must not forget them. Stars wave for us beyond another forest of barrier trees, and beneath them, Archeon. At first, I don't see the capital at all, mistaking its lights for blazing stars. As we sail closer and closer, my jaw drops. A triple-layered bridge runs across the wide river, linking the two cities on either side. It's thousands of feet long and thriving, along with light and electricity. There are shops and market squares, all built into the bridge itself, a hundred feet above the river. I can just picture the silvers up there, drinking and eating and looking down on the world from their place on high. Transports blaze along the lowest tier of the bridge, their headlamps like red and white comets cutting through the night. Both ends of the bridge are gated, and the city sectors on either side are walled in. On the east bank, Great metal towers stab out of the ground like swords to pierce the sky, all crowned with gleaming giant birds of prey. More transports and people populate the paved streets that climb their hilly riverbanks, connecting the buildings to the bridge and the outer gates. The walls are diamond glass, like back at the hall, but set with a flood with flood lit metal towers and other structures. There are patrols on the walls. But the uniforms are not the flaming red of sentinels or the stark black of security. They were soldiers of clouded silver and white, almost blending into the cityscape. They are soldiers, and not the kind who dance with ladies. This is a fortress. Archeon was built to endure war, not peace. On the western bank, I recognize the royal court and treasury hall from the bombing footage. Both are made from gleaming white marble and fully repaired, even though they were attacked barely more than a month ago. It feels like a lifetime. They flank White Fire pl Palace, a building I even I know on sight. My old teacher used to say it was carved from the hillside itself, a living piece of the white stone. Flames made of gold and gold and pearl flash atop the surrounding walls. I tried to take it in, my eyes darting between both ends of the bridge, but my mind just can't fathom this place. Overhead, airships move slowly th in, through the night sky. Mmm, excuse me. Mmm, excuse me, so sorry. 
while air jets fly even higher, as fast as shooting stars. I thought the Hall of the Sun was a wonder. Uh, apparently, I never knew the meaning of the word. But I can't find anything beautiful here. Not when the smoky, dark factories are only a few miles back. The contrast between the Silver City and the Red Slum sets my teeth on edge. This is the world I'm trying to bring down. The world trying to kill me and everything I care about. Now I truly see what I'm fighting against and how difficult, how impossible it will be to win. I ne I've never felt smaller than I do now. The great bridge looming above us looks ready to swallow me whole. But I have to try. If only for Greytown. For the ones who have never seen the sun. And that is the end of chapter 22. Holy moly. Goodness gracious. I, I'm really excited for uh, as we read these next few chapters of the book. Because it really should start picking up now. Um, and whatnot, but yeah. So, thank you guys very much for watching. Um, I, again, this is one of my favorite books. I've read this before. I know what happens. So I'm not going to spoil anything. Um, the one that I want to point out, though, is, like, it kind of makes me wonder why the kiss from Maven was so sudden. It makes me wonder if Cal was secretly watching and Maven saw him. And in all honesty, I think Cal is indeed hurt by the fact that, because it really seems like, and I'm just going to scoot back a little bit. Like, Cal and Mare, they seem like they had a really good chemistry compared to Maven and Mare, honestly. Like, and I know I've kind of talked about that before, but just, I don't know. I like Cal and Mare more. And I, I'm pretty sure it probably hurt Cal pretty bad to think, like, oh, you know, like, the kiss meant nothing or this meant nothing, you know. I mean, I mean he's got to be hurt, you know. But, um, yeah, I am excited for the chapters to come. Um, and also before I forget, there are some things going on in life. Nothing bad or anything negative. You know, everything's okay. Uh, I'm safe and everything, everyone's healthy. Just some random stuff going on. So the reading videos, I'm still going to try and make, but they might be a little, not far a few between, but kind of far a few between, you know, like, like you might see a post of me saying like, Hey, you know, I can't record tonight or something like that. I don't know. Um, but yeah, nothing bad's happening. It's just circumstances. So anyway, um, yeah, that is all. I, again, I hope everyone very thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, I'm really excited to keep reading this and hopefully start reading the second one to you guys eventually. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so very much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed and I will see you all in my next video. Mwah.